All right. Well, let's let's get our speakers up here. The uh, first person I want to introduce to you for the panel. Uh, he earned a bachelor's degree in television, film, and new media production from San Diego State University. He's worked as a producer, associate programmer, and juror for the Temecula Valley International Film and Music Festival. He's an assistant director, second unit director for the feature film Something Blue. He is now currently starting his sixth year as the San Diego producer for the 48-hour film project. A man who's a glutton for punishment. Let's have a big round of applause for Dwayne Trammell. <laughs> All right, not too big. We like to save it for the others. No. <laughs> All right, our next panel member, uh, he has a team, the Amalgamated Grommets, and they've participated in the 48-hour film project for the last five years. They've won the San Diego competition three times, and one of their films, The Fatal Air, was included in the 2011 Best of 48-Hour Film Project DVD and was chosen to screen at the Cannes Film Festival. He's a director, and in real life, he makes commercials and web videos, and he does that very well. Let's have a warm welcome from Mike Brugemeyer. Kind of reminds me. All right, we don't have a dress code. Okay. High five and everything. I didn't hear it. I said, I said we don't have a dress code. <laughs> If you did have a dress code, I would have worn a dress. <laughs> Could you return mine? <laughs> okay, last but not least, uh, he's a self-taught filmmaker. He started filmmaking by, le learning to, uh, uh, by leading a team with his son Jacob for the 2009 San Diego 48-hour film project. He produced another film for 2010 that was a flop. This is his words. Joe got the bug and produced four films in 2011, four in 2012, and plans four more for this year. Of the 10 48-hour films he has produced, five have earned accolades for his team, Hunter Productions. He hopes to continue that success this year under the new name of Preposterous Films. Let's have a warm welcome for Joe Castano. Yay. Thanks. Hi. Joe's very formal. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll kick this off. Uh, each of the panel members they, they, uh, will take five, six minutes each to just uh, say a few things, and that may be talking points for you. And once they're through, the three of them, then we'll open up the Q&A, questions you have, and, or between the three of you. So these guys are experts at this, very successful. So uh, I will start with my history as a 48-hour a filmmaker that leads into my history as uh, now, uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's actually five years producing uh, the 48-hour film project. Um, I originally did a 48-hour film in 2005 um, called um, Superhero Form 3254-A. I'm not really good with titles. Um, and it was runner-up to best film. And then I did another one in 2007 called Debt to Nate. Again, I'm not good with titles. And that was runner-up to best film. And I found out that they were looking for a producer in 2009, and I applied. But as a filmmaker, and seeing how the 48-hour how the film project had been run in the past, I, I wanted to come to it with uh, a filmmaker's perspective, and how can you make it a filmmaker-oriented competition. And so when they interviewed me on the phone, they liked what I had to say, and that was uh, now going on five years ago. And so we've tried to make this a filmmaker-friendly, filmmaker-oriented competition. Um, and uh, it's, it's a great competition to be involved in. Uh, can I have a show of hands, anyone that has done a 48-hour film? OK, that's great. Uh, what's really good is how many hands didn't go up. Because uh, we found out that there's a, a year-end competition, or a year-end screening of all the films that produced during the year internationally called Filmapalooza, and I found out this year at the producer's uh, breakfast that Paris was the largest 48-hour city ever with 113 teams. Now, I have nothing against the, uh, the, the French, but screw those Frenchies, we're going to bring that title back to Southern California. <laughs> and I'm hoping to put together uh, 130 teams for San Diego this year. And just lock it down. So if you are on the fence, whether you want to do a 48-hour film or not, we have a lot of resources to help you do a 48-hour film. 
And uh, I would encourage you to take the plunge if you have any filmmaking experience at all, or as Joe in 2009 had zero filmmaking experience. And look where he is now. His film from last year was runner up to best film, only, second only to Mike Brueggemeyer's film, Momentum, that uh, was the winning film. So uh, it, it is possible. If you have the desire, you can do it. Um, so now let me explain how the 48 Hour Film Project works. It uh, is a competition, it's not a film festival, although all the films that are produced um, that fall within certain criteria will be screened, uh, whether they are turned in on time or not. Um, and mainly the only reason we wouldn't screen a film is if it's not a complete film or it has uh, you know, really, really bad sexuality and things like that in it, so I encourage people not to do that. Uh, and another, really, really good sexuality is okay. Yeah, really, really good stuff. I'm okay with. I'm okay with. Um, so the way it works is that you register a team. Registration started yesterday. Uh, at, and registration costs $140 to register a complete team um, or a team. It doesn't matter if it's one person or 50 or 100. It's one cost to register a team. Then uh, we have a kickoff event that will happen on July 12th and at the kickoff event one representative from each team comes uh, we separate the, them into the screening groups that they're assigned to and then each screening group draws from a list of the film genres that are available on the website uh, and once all the teams and all the screening groups draw their genres then I have three envelopes that uh, are, I get from the 48-hour headquarters in Washington, D.C. One is a line of dialogue, the other is a character, and one is a prop. And I open those three envelopes up one at a time. Your dialogue is, keep, this, keep that away from me. Uh, your character is M. Munchley, Mary or Mike Munchley, computer programmer. And your prop is a salt shaker. And I, I saved the last one until just before 7 o'clock because competition doesn't start until 7, 7 p.m. So it's really, it's kind of like, and no derogatory uh, comparison here, but it's like roaches scattering when you turn the lights on <laughs> because I say, and your prop is a salt shaker. And everyone, there's a pregnant pause where everyone kind of stands there. And I'm like, go make a film. And it's like, pew. <laughs> so it's, it's really fun. It's great fun. Um, then you have 48 hours, so you have from 7 p.m. Friday night until 7.30 p.m. Sunday. And I know you're all calculating that's actually 48 hours and 30 minutes, but that 30 minutes is travel time so that you can get to the drop-off location safely. Um, although I have seen people not only scream in and forget the park, jump out of their car and have to jump back in because their car is still rolling forward. <laughs> and uh, that actually happened at Video Gear in Sereno Valley one year. Uh, and then I've also seen people get their dad, who is a San Diego police officer, give them a police escort to a drop-off. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's great fun. It's a lot of high energy. It's, it can be a tough weekend, um, and, but it's so much fun. And then on the drop-off will be July 14th, 7.30 p.m. The screenings will start on July 30th. I have to have time to process all the films. Uh, to put the ballots together for audience choice balloting and the program cards. Um, and I, I convert all the films into DCP so that they can play natively on the projection system at the theater, which means that San Diego is all high definition. You can shoot in standard def. Thank you. You can shoot in standard def, but we will up res to high def uh, for projection. And one notable thing about that is that San Diego, for six years now, has been the only all high def 48 hour city in the world out of 125 cities worldwide. So it's a lot of work, it's a lot of processing time and it's so worth it when you see these great films up on the screen. Um, then we have on August 10th, we have a uh, award ceremony. Now the screenings are your premier screenings. So there's nothing better than walking down a red carpet that we roll out with videographers, photographers, red carpet interviewers, San Diego songwriters provide live musicians in the theater lobby. And it's a great atmosphere. You can talk to people who've done it before. It is so much fun. We, we also have live musicians in the theater as you're taking your seat. And it is nothing, there's nothing better. It's like at, being at Grauman's Chinese Theater, 
you are walking the red carpet to see the premiere of your film, not somebody else's film, your film on the big screen with five, 499 of your friends and, and other moviegoers. It's a fantastic experience. Okay, I, I just want to get Mike involved here, sure. talking about preparation. <clears throat> Okay. We get an idea of what this is about. It is exciting, uh, and let's just go into uh, prepping from your perspective. Okay, um, <clears throat> we've done. My my group has been doing this since two thousand eight. Um, the The challenge of prepping for a forty eight hour film project film is that you don't know what you're going to prep for. I mean, it's like it's prepping for Armageddon, but you don't know what Armageddon's going to be. And if it's locusts, then you didn't prepare for locusts. You're screwed. Um, the, you want to get a group of people together. Whether that group is three people or 28, you need to figure that out in advance. You're, from a director's perspective, you need to figure out the resources that you're going to be able to use effectively. You don't want to have a situation where you, you start the process of trying to make a film and you've never worked with a big crew before and suddenly you have a big crew and they're all standing around waiting for your direction. You don't know where to turn. Um, the, there have been some very good films made with a crew of four. There have been some very good films made with a crew of, of 30. Uh, it's just a, a matter of what your experience and style works best with. Ours, we generally have a crew in between 25 and 30. Um, we have a lot of resources at our disposal. Um, for some reason, when you win a film, uh, a 48 hour film project, everybody comes to you and says, I want to help you. Um, but we have, we have a lot of resources and that allows us to craft our story to the resources. Um, if, if we didn't have those resources, uh, we would craft our story to the resources we have. And there are two things that, that I kind of hold sacred in this process. One, um, story. Make sure your story can, can be told. Make sure um, when you work out your film, you have to work out your story and your script and your storyboard in a way that's accomplishable with the crew and the cast and the resources you have. Um, and then the other one is having whatever size of crew you have, make sure that they are compatible, for lack of a better word. Um, if, if you have one person on your set who has a problem with someone else, everybody is affected by it. So the biggest challenge for, for us as filmmakers is to find that group of people that meshes so that when you face stress and challenge, if you have the right group of people, they all greet that stress and challenge with a positive attitude and, and collaboration. Um, if you have uh, somebody on your team who uh, does not know how to collaborate, you're going to have problems. And that's, I would rather have people who are unskilled and good collaborators than with amazing skills and th the ability to disrupt a set. Um, when we are prepping for the 48 hour film project, everybody on the team, we send out emails, everybody on the team starts asking their friends and neighbors for locations, wardrobe, props, just anything that might come up. And so the first year that we did this, uh, we found out we were doing a historical fiction film. And uh, the, the story that we chose to tell was the, the moments after Abe Lincoln gets shot, what happens with Mary Todd. And we put out the, the word on Friday evening, this is what we're doing. And everybody on the, on the film just rummaged through all their antiques and went through their neighbor's garages. And you know, everybody has that filmmaker attitude of, I can help and I want to fi find a way to, to help. So we had more 
props and wardrobe and and uh, and uh, furniture than we needed. Um, if if this is your first time doing this, I would recommend that you find a small group. Um, it's easier to kind of corral a small group and do a small small film, basically a, a film that's controllable and accomplishable because it's hard enough to do this, to let alone trying to, for a first time, take on something that's really big and challenging. Um, and the, it's, when you go to the screenings, there are some very, very good films in San Diego. Every year there are some remarkable films. And when we, when we went to Filmapalooza in LA, it drove home the fact that there were many, many films that were city winners in other cities that wouldn't have been in our best of screening. Mm -hmm. San Diego has some wonderfully talented filmmakers. That being said, we have tons of teams, and some of those films, when you watch them, you'll realize that there's no ending, or there's no middle, <laughs> or there's no beginning. <laughs> so the basic, the fir if, you're, if you're doing this for the first time, the, the first basic accomplishment is make sure that you have a beginning, a middle, and an end. It sounds stupid, but it's, it's a challenge sometimes, particularly when you have schedule challenges and location challenges and <coughs> cops and... <laughs> you know, you went from uh, absolute uh, plot <laughs> to turn over a bit. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Anyhow, uh, you... <laughs> I wonder if it wasn't working. <laughs> Sal's loving this. I'll never hear the end of this. But I don't care. No, they don't shoot me. They'd like to, but anyhow, uh, Joe, you went from absolute flop to almost to the top. Um, what did you do uh, and, and that experience that turned things around, how, how would you, uh, you know, what would you say to people that are new, people that are experienced? Sure, sure let me start at the beginning. Uh, 2009. Um, Wayne said to me, hey, why don't you make a film? I said, okay. I, um, I never picked up a camera before in my life. I wanted to do something with my teenage son, something we can do together. I said, let's do this project. And, and we, we found a guy with, with a, a camera and, and some editing tools, and me and my son and George, we made a film. It was Victor, 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 the musical. Lucky enough to pick musical the first time. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we had, it was just a, 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 a blast. We had so much fun. I said, we've got to do this again. And I did it again in 2009. And this time I went out and I tried to find some <coughs> qualified people to, to help me and so I can learn. And we made a film that had some pretty good production value, but the story was so bad it was just really hard to watch. But the point is, even though the movie was a flop, it wasn't a flop for me because I learned so much from, <laughs> from these guys that I was able to recruit them to my, them to my team. That uh, the next year I said, hey, I'm going to have more fun, and I did it four times. And I'm going to do it four times. We did Inland Empire, we did the Produce, Producers Guild, and we did the National Film Challenge, which is a 72-hour version, actually, of the 48-hour film project. So anyway, um, each one of those films got progressively better and better, and each time I did a film, I specifically aimed to do something I haven't done before. Um, and to recruit new people, to add music to the film, I met with uh, Cliff at the San Diego <laughs> Songwriters group, I found some people to add music to my film, which I hadn't done before properly. I've done it before, but not properly. But anyway, in um, 2012, which was last year, we did the four films again. Again, each one getting a little bit better. For when we did Genie Boot Camp, it was the first time we shot in a DSLR. Um, when we, when we sh so in any case, better and better each time. But the whole point was that each time I made some effort to do something different, something new, to learn something new and to, and to make the film better. Um, but in, in any case, in preparing for, for one of these films, in any and all of these films, it's just like preparing for any other film. Um, you gotta do people, places, things, and time. And you gotta bring those all together to make a film. Except for a 48 hour film project, the time is the issue. So you gotta make your people, places, things fit into those 48 hours. Um, so. I guess during this discussion, if we take that people, places, things, and break that down and discuss each one of those elements, I mean, we can, we can get a lot done today. And you guys can, I think, be inspired to pick up a camera if you can't find a team or 
I, I heard enough people in here that looking for a team that they could make their own team, make a film tonight. Let me ask you, how, how do you pick people for your team? What, do you, what are you looking for? How, how do you judge them? How do you, how do you well, vet, vet them? And, and Dwayne, jump in because you've done a lot of these things yeah. before, you, before you took on the job of producer. I, I got pretty lucky. The first 48-hour uh, film I did, I had just graduated uh, film school, so most of my team was people that I'd gone to school with. Uh, we also got really lucky in our location, um, and I just approached Stu Siegel Productions, and this was back when they did a lot of production, and I said, hey, look, we just graduated San Diego State. We're, we'd like to do a 48-hour film. I have other students that are working on this. Um, can, we, you know, can we talk about using your space? And, and at zero cost, we had a production office, all available studio space that, that was not being used for anything else, the full wardrobe department, the full prop department, picture vehicles and back lot at zero cost to us. And it was phenomenal. We, you know, I had a cast and crew of 49 people and everyone was doing something. And uh, the, the film is online. If you look me up on IMDb, you can watch the film there. So, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, and then in 2007, it was just people that I'd worked with before. And this is how you build these collaborations is working on projects and you know uh, who works best in what position. I agree with Mike, you know, I, I have, a zero tolerance for drama on set. It's already hard enough. And if someone is causing trouble, I ask them to leave. I don't want them there anymore, you know? And I've gone through that uh, in film school, working on student films where you have people, and you can't, you can't make them leave because they're students and they're doing their film, and it's like, uh, it's just so hard. It's so hard. Um, I, I actually want to make one comment about uh, the story. Uh, Mike is absolutely right, beginning, middle, and end. But one of the tricks to writing a great story is to come up with your idea, your tagline, and then figure out what your ending is. You want to know what your ending is first. It doesn't matter where it starts. What you want to know is what your ending is. Then from there, you figure out where to start your film. And then you have a place to write to. You're not 30 pages in and still have no idea what your ending's gonna be. You have a beginning, you, pick your, you have your ending, you pick your beginning, and you write to your end. And that's how you get a great, a great story. I recommend for this five pages. Um, I know, Marianne, you like to do oh, 20 ahead. pages. But, uh, <laughs> and then trim down. But I, I recommend five pages. It's a four to seven minute long film is what you're trying to make. Five pages falls right in the middle of that. And uh, you'll, you will edit longer, generally, rather than shorter. So shoot for five pages, make it easy on your writing team. And uh, I, I think that's the best way to do it. What about location? I mean, in preparing for location, because you don't know what your film's gonna be until you know, it's picked out of the I, hat. So. I, as a participant, I search for locations that can be used for anything. A loading dock, uh, a back alley. Um, I've used uh, this upholstery shop behind my house in several films, and it just has great character. A uh, coffee shop down the street. Um, what I recommend that you don't do is shoot at home or shoot in your apartment, um, because it looks like you're at home and it looks like you're in an apartment. So try to go Try to push your comfort level as far as you can and shoot outside, you know, the, the cliche term, outside the box. Um, that's what you want to go because, you know, look at all the people that are going to be doing 48 hour films that they shot in their apartment. Do you really want to be a part of that crowd? You want to be the, the people that found this great alley or this great, you know, um, mechanics, you know, workshop or something like that. And that's what I would be going for is, is a lo locations that can be used for multiple things. You shoot, you shoot that way, it means one thing. You shoot that way, it means something else. That way, that way. You have four locations you can shoot in, and each one can be a different character. Mike, Joe, do you want to add anything to that? or What he said. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, um, um, when, when, when we start our prep, I mean, and, and we'll be doing that very soon, I'm going to be sending out an email to the entire team saying, Ask your friends, ask your neighbors about whether we, if whether they would be willing to have us come and use their house, or come and use their place of business, or if they have a car. You know, we we. Um, I mean, in 2010, we did a film noir film, 
and we placed it in the 40s. Well, Marianne has a friend who owns a car from the 1940s, so we had him bring it down to OB and late on a Saturday night to shoot a night exterior of this car. I mean, uh, we shot in a diner in OB that has, that could look like 1940s. So we, if we had gotten something else, we probably would have used the diner in some other way. You just have to get as many resources as you can and then when the day happens, you figure out what your story needs, figure out the resources that you have, write your story around those resources, and then call everybody back who you've, who you've arranged for their home or whatever and say, I'm sorry, we, we got silent film, we can't use your you know, club or whatever, so. Joe, were there any mistakes yeah. you made in yeah. the flop? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but from the pr producer's standpoint, when you, when you okay, it's great to find, find all these locations, but what you have to do is, the people who own these places, you have to, you have to be very uh, clear in them. What, you know, what access do you have? You know, what time can you be there? How long can you stay? Um, make sure you're gonna clean the place up when you leave. Um, you're gonna have to ask them, um, you know, do you have access to bathroom facilities? Um, is there anybody else going to be there that we need to work around? You have to identify your, your electrical, make sure you have a place to plug your lights in. These are all the things that you may forget and say, hey, somebody said I can use the, the window, um, the window um, warehouse to shoot uh, a scene for Genie Boot Camp. And, and when we got there, we found out it was uh, not suitable. We did shoot a scene there, but we had to go shoot somewhere else for the rest of the rest of the film. But uh, so that was a mistake in that we relied on the, the gentleman's description of the place and how it would work for us, only to find out, well, it's not quite suitable for us. So you need to scout it out, you need to check it out, you need to look at the lighting, uh, where the sun is, uh, different parts of the day, you might have different sunlight, might not work for the senior you're trying to shoot. How close yeah. they are to an airport. <laughs> <laughs> like right overhead. <laughs> but anyway, so th uh, those are things in locations, specifically bath asthma facility is important. You might end up in a place where you meant, we did end up in one of our movies, end up shuttling people a couple miles away for a bathroom because we didn't have one. So those are things important for locations that you need to be aware of and plan for. Yeah, I want to open up if anybody has you know, questions let's, and, and we'll take you one at a time. Uh, okay. For locations, do you have to Liability and, per, uh, and permits. Uh, you do have a liability uh, location release form that you have to use. Uh, and if you're shooting on private property, you don't need to get a permit to do it. So if you're shooting on a public street or something like that, then you do have to have that. Uh, but private property, no, you don't have to have that. Um, the only thing, the only time you need to get the police involved really is if you are going to be blocking the street or something like that. Uh, you do need to, if you're going to be, um, if you want to reserve uh, space, uh, like parking space, we shot at the Plaza Hotel downtown, and so we had to uh, get um, a uh, permit to block off some city, part of the city streets apartment spaces, and we had to rent signs to put them up there. We had to let the, all the, the neighboring businesses know that we were shooting there. Um, and that's mainly because we were out in the street. We were shooting a, a couple scenes in the street. But once we got inside the hotel and we were shooting in the basement and up on the rooftop and stuff, we, we had no problem at all because it's private property. Just make sure you get the location of these. As far as, as permits, it's impossible to do. Um, you're finding out your genre and then you're writing your story and that's happening at 7 p.m. on a Friday. The permit office is closed. <laughs> it doesn't open on Saturday. So uh, you, you have to figure out a way to accomplish what you're going to accomplish without, I mean officially, without shooting in city streets or at least without getting caught. You can't stop traffic. Um, <laughs> I'm saying you can. Um, it, it's, there's plenty of people who do it. Uh, there's plenty of people who shoot downtown, um, but it's not legal. <clears throat> so get in, do what you have to do, and be courteous to the neighbors. Yes. Very courteous. 
So somebody else had a question? That was it. Anybody else have? Yes. When you're um, setting up your agenda, your, your timeline for the next 48 hours, what does that typically look like? Are you writing a script for a couple of hours and then you move on into... Can I take this? Yes. Can I take notes? We set up our timeline backward. Okay? We want to turn our film in an hour and a half before the deadline. So we make a schedule from an hour and a half before the, the deadline, moving backward. How long is it going to take to export a seven minute film from your edit system in the codec that they want? We do a test, we find that out. We subtract that from 6 p.m. or whatever. We we figure out when we're going to, how long we're going to do color correction, if we're going to do scoring. I mean, we just build a schedule backward all the way through the process and end up on Friday night with <clears throat> pulling a genre out of a hat. Um, the reason we schedule an hour and a half before the deadline is because something's going to happen that will eat up that hour and a half. Uh, we've been doing it uh, five years now. I think if you added up all of the extra time that we've had over those five years, I think it'd be about 10 minutes. <laughs> um, it just, whatever, whatever time is there is gonna get used up somehow. Yeah, well, well for me, I think the basics of the scheduling is write it on Friday, shoot it on Saturday, edit it on Sunday. But of course, there's a lot of overlap in there. It's nice if you can have uh, your editor getting your footage from the set and you can start capturing, logging, and, and maybe even start cutting something together early in the day on Saturday, rather than wait until Sunday morning to do it. Um, also, it's a 48-hour film project. That doesn't mean everybody should be up for 48 hours. It's, it's crazy, it's impossible, and it's not healthy. Uh, from, even though our production runs the full 48 hours without stopping, everybody gets some time to, to rest two or three hours nap uh, each night, if you can do it. Uh, the director has the least like, likely chance of getting some sleep, but I think it's important that, that he does. And if you, if, you have your, if you have your crew as people you can trust, I mean, we turn the footage over to the editor, and he goes at it uh, Saturday night, and I go home and sleep. And generally, I get like seven hours sleep. Show up the next day around 9 a.m., and he's got an edit together. And then we start fine-tuning. So if you, can, if you have the capability of turning over the footage to somebody who you can trust with the story, and they run with it. That's a wonderful thing. We got a question in the back. About the equipment that you assemble, uh, obviously you need a camera. Take me down, what's the next most critical piece of gear? What's the next most uh, critical piece of gear? Let me start, let me start and then I'll let Mike uh, jump in here. Uh, for me, it's like, you know, it's better to, to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. So I just cram everything I got in my car. Or everything I, <laughs> that's an exaggeration, but you have to look at, um, your, 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 your camera, your lighting, and your audio gear, if you don't have all of those three things, you know, one of them isn't more important than the other. If you're missing one of those, your film isn't gonna work right, or look right, or sound right. So all those three things, top of the list, your lighting, your sound, recording equipment, and your camera. And, and then beyond that, um, ways to hold and move your camera, ways to control your light, and uh, somebody to hold the boom pole. <laughs> Um, we, when we start our prep process, we make a decision usually about a week in advance on what kind of camera we want to use. Um, we, we, uh, this past year, I, I make local commercials. I make, that's what I do. Uh, generally local, low budget commercials. So the bulk of my time, I go out as a one man band and I, shoot and I record audio and I do lighting and I do makeup and you know I'm that guy um, and so when I do the 48 hour film project it's the best weekend of my year because I get to be a director and not a director hyphen um, so as we this this um, this past year I had a job that was lined up in the same week as the 48 hour film project it was the week before and the day before the shoot, it was a two-day shoot, the client couldn't get something together, and so I had to move the second day back a week, which meant that I had a shoot day here and a shoot day there, and I rented the camera for the week, and we used that camera over the weekend. 
total luck um, that, that I could have somebody else pay for our camera, which was awesome. Um, but if we, if we hadn't done that, we would have called around to the group and said, what camera do you have? What camera do you have? What camera can you get? What lenses do you have? And we cobble together the best of what we have. Um, the, uh, we do the same thing with lighting. Uh, sometimes it's, we have a, a guy who comes and helps out with a grip truck, JT, if you know JT. Um, he couldn't make it last year, so we cobbled lighting together. We called everybody and said, we need lights, bring your lights. And so that's what we ended up using for, I mean, there was a, plenty of scenes where we had a, a uh, light bulb in a china lantern, and that was our primary source of light. <coughs> because that's what we have. You know, one thing about equipment um, is that one of our sponsor partners is Video Gear. And Video Gear offers a 10% uh, discount and a one day rental charge for the whole weekend. You can rent whatever you want for 10% off and you pick it up Friday night, don't have to drop it off until Monday and you get it for one day, the cost of a one day rental. So it's a phenomenal resource. They have all kinds of great equipment there. So I highly recommend looking and, into them. And I love the fact that while he was saying that, the employees of Video Gear turned his mic up. <laughs> I, I they want to keep their job. And now they're going to turn my mic up. Um, the folks at Video Gear not only know about their equipment, but they know about filmmaking. They're a great resource. If you are thinking about putting together a package, a camera package for a shoot or, or an audio package, ask them. They can help you. They hear the horror stories of people coming back like me who, when I screw up something, I come back to them and say, <laughs> and they hear that and they, the next time somebody wants to rent that equipment package, they can say, you know, you really wanna, don't want to do that. This combination isn't very good. Um, but they're a great resource for production. I have something. Uh, and one more. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, regardless of what camera you choose, it could be your cell phone or it could be some high-end camera. Like it's the the key. The key thing for me is you need to test your workflow on that camera. You need to take take some take some video with that camera. It could be anything. Ten seconds, twenty seconds, doesn't matter. Take figure out how you're going to get it out of the camera into your editing machine, onto your timeline. How it's going to how it, how it's going to cut together on your on your timeline and how you're going to render it out and how you're going to get it on that flash drive yeah, for delivery. Yeah. You can do all that in one day with 10 seconds worth yeah. of video, but you need you know, to you need to, to really know those steps and yeah. know that they're going to work and not find out that, hey, I got these great pictures in this camera, but I have no idea how to get it into the computer. So that's I, I agree with that, except I would say do about seven minutes. <laughs> Because you want to know how long it's going to take to export your film. And when you export your film, for all the editors in the room, here's the trick. Export directly to the flash drive that you're going to turn in, then copy back to your hard drive. And the reason is that the flash drive can handle the data rate um, that it's, that's being recorded to it, and they record much slower than they, than they read. So when you uh, are done, you can, re you can copy that back to your hard drive much faster than it would, than it would be as if, if you rendered to your hard drive and copied onto your flash drive. You save a lot of time doing it that way. Yeah, part of your preparation is being familiar with your equipment and knowing yeah. how to use it and not learning during the 48 hours. You know what, there's going to be enough learning going on. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's like film school boot camp. Um, you, you, every year I think, I got this, I know what I'm doing, and every year it's like, oh crap, look what I'm learning. <laughs> I, I learned more doing a 48-hour film than I did in film school, for sure. Especially about the, the really intense amount of time that, it, that you, you know, you're working in just such a small window of time. Every decision you make you have to be very careful with because it can drastically impact the production quality and the, the value of your story um, later. So, you ha I mean, you don't have... It, it, time is not a luxury that you have in a 48-hour film project. When you're doing a film outside of that, you know, you can spend all kinds of time pre-production and post-production and editing and, you know, shooting pickup shots and stuff like that. You don't have that luxury. And so it makes for a very intense, uh, uh, interestingly, creatively, you get a lot of freedom. 
because you're, you're free to say, okay, if you're, if you're shooting a short film or a feature or something and you've been in pre-production and you've been scouting locations, you know when I get here I'm going to shoot this, when I get here I'm going to shoot that. What if you draw romance and the only thing you have is, is a loading dock, is like the best <laughs> location you have? Well, what do you do? You have to get creative. And it really gets, it really gets you into the, the creative part of filmmaking doing that. It's not restrictive at all. It's the exact opposite. Okay, you got a question there, Jim? Shooting ratios and shots. Up to the director. Yeah, up to the our, director. Our, uh, our well, the question was shooting ratios and shots. Yeah, right. shot list. You know, a lot of people shoot ten times more than they can ever get through with edit and transcode and stuff. And so, you know, you got seven minutes. You know, seventy minutes is like ten to one. So, but uh, you want to. The challenge here is you want to give the editor enough words to tell the story, um, but you don't want to have the editor rummaging through footage as your as your deadline goes past. So what I end up doing, I have a shot list and then I throw it out. <laughs> <laughs> what I do with the shot list is I tell the story the way I want to tell it. And then I get two shots in and I'm nine shots behind and I just start crossing everything off and I mean the first film that we did was was in 2008 it was in this studio and um, we were we were so far behind schedule by the time we started shooting that the first shot that we got was a dolly shot and 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 people come into the room and there's a scene happening and it happens and I'm like roll, roll, roll. <laughs> okay cut got like 45 seconds in that opening scene with no coverage. And the editor's like, I can't do anything with this. And I'm like, don't do anything with that. I was watching the story, it was playing out, just leave it alone and let it play. You were shooting uh, the camera. Yeah, unfortunately, yes, I was shooting in the camera. I was editing in the camera. I was figuring out what I needed because I couldn't, at that point, get what I wanted. And thank God, because the story turned out much better the way it was told than the way that I saw it in my head. But it, the, when you do this, you have to learn economy. Because money, time is money and time is a resource and you don't have much of it. Perfect question. Perfect transition. So talking about money, what type of budget do you guys typically set up for this? Uh, per, well, well, I'll right. take it. Per, um, personally, my I spend about 600 bucks on each of my 48 hour film productions and that covers uh, food for the crew, um, DVDs for the cast and crew when I'm done, um, and uh, any expendables we need. I never, um, I've never paid for location or for cast and crew or any, or any of those things, but the food and uh, DVDs for the cast and crew and expendables, I spent about $600. And I think that's probably maybe a little on the high side. I could be wrong. But. Mm, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, the, the first one I did, I think I spent 2500 But 600 of that was for production insurance because I had to have it shooting at Stu, Stu Siegel. And 500 of it was uh, I wanted to really treat the cast and crew. So um, I had arranged for, at the very end of our shoot, for a mobile uh, espresso cart to come up. And everyone uh, at the production center got whatever they wanted, a cappuccino, a latte, whatever. And uh, since most of them were still San Diego State students, um, I would go back periodically to talk about uh, filmmaking with you know, the, the advanced film students. And uh, for probably three years, it's like, are you the guy that had that mobile coffee cart? Because that is so <laughs> awesome. So, it, it was a great treat, and it was very memorable for everyone, and then everyone got a copy of the film. It's important to treat your crew right. They're giving up, um, in most cases, a Saturday, an all-day Saturday, a very long Saturday, and they want a copy of the film, and they want their name in the credits. So don't shortchange anyone in the credit role, and make sure they get a copy uh, on DVD. Um, uh, one thing about this is that it's really important, I think, and this is my own personal thing, you may disagree with me, I don't show the crew the film 
I want them to see it for the first time in high def on the big screen with 500 other people. Yep. And so I, was like, I tell people, don't show it to them. Don't let them see it on their, your cell phone or Vimeo on a, on a laptop or something. Show it to them on the big screen, 25 feet picture, you know, you know come on, do it right. They, it's, it's a rare treat for them to walk down the red carpet and see it for the first time. Yeah. There's a question. One of the, oh, do you want today? One yeah. of the things that we do is we, if, you, if you're going to participate, we want you to either pitch in in equipment or in <coughs> dollars. So um, if, you are, if you are providing our camera, you don't have to pay money. If you aren't providing equipment or a location or whatever, then we ask for 40 bucks, something around that range. And invariably, there's a person who ends up throwing in quite a bit more than that because we adore him. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, if you show, um, the IMDb listing is hard to get. Um, if your film is screened at a film festival, and we partner with the San Diego Film Festival and the San Diego Asian Film Festival, used to the Temecula, but they've kind of, they went on a hiatus two years ago, and I haven't seen them come back yet. So, um, But I try to get as many films in the festivals as I can, because that's the easiest way to get an IMDb listing. Um, and yeah, I encourage you if you are if you get into the uh, uh, into a film festival, make sure you get the IMDb listing. It's a great payback for your casting crew. Do you know that any film festivals or specific ones to get uh, credits? Uh, to get IMDb credits? On IMDb. Yeah, if you're screened at a film festival, then you are eligible for it. Yeah, you have to show proof that it was screened somewhere, either a website listing or something like that. Yeah. Blaine, question. Um, if, the, let's say, the lead person has an IMDb credit, will new credits kind of propagate out from that? Is that possible? You know, that, that's a good question. Usually the producer is the one that lists the credits. Mike, I think, has an answer for you, but sure. I, I know it's, it's difficult sure. to when, get that. It has been. In, in our experience, when, uh, when we're doing one of these, I, you, can, you can apply to have an IMDb credit for your film. Um, you fill out pages and pages and pages of the worst written code on <laughs> the earth, um, and you put in everybody's name and all the job titles, and then they look at it and tell you whether it's approved or not. Um, and then you go around and around and around, and then finally it ends up showing up on the website. So, so you end up putting in, all, as a producer, you end up putting in all those names and job titles. But if you already have, as a producer, if you already are in the IMDb, will those new names to IMDb automatically be granted? No, it, it, you have to show proof. Yeah. You have to yeah. show proof. They will ask for proof in, yeah. in the process. They will ask yeah. for proof. Joe, you had add, something to Yeah, the gentleman asked about the, the festivals. If you, go, if you have a without a box um, account, that's where you can uh, submit online to film festivals. And if you go under their browse film festivals section, there's, there's a, there's a drop-down list specifically for film festivals that are IMDB eligible. And there's hundreds of them in there. And there's dozens of them local. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and the way that works is that you, you submit your film to those festivals, and even if the festival is not included, if your film's not included in the festival, they can approve it for an IMDb listing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, you can find that out later. Let me ask you this. Your most memorable experience that you would like to forget in any... any why don't we just run down the panel? Uh, let me see. Joe's trying to think of just yeah, one. Yeah, I got too many. I got, I got one. Okay, let Mike go first. <laughs> uh, 2011, we wrote, I don't know, how many pages? 11, 13, 12? 12. 12 pages with effects and costume changes and special, uh, lots of effects, actually. <coughs> and uh, we got about, I don't know, 10 hours into the shoot day, and it was uh, slowly occurring to me that we had another... 30 hours to go, um, and uh, at the, we, had, we were shooting inside a house, and in order to make the lighting consistent, 
during the daytime, we tented the outside of the house. We blocked all the windows and then did our lighting inside the house. And we uh, shot all day. And then when it got dark, we had the tenting, we had the grips take the tenting down. And the moment I remember is we still weren't done and I could see the sun coming up and I'm sitting there thinking, we're gonna have to put the tenting back up. <laughs> we had been shooting for 23 hours. And you know, you don't do your best work like that. And that, that film, we were very proud of that film. That film, we like how that film turned out, but that was the one where, where I felt like I had shot my crew in the head. <laughs> and, and it's the darkest, the darkest moment when, when I'm sitting there going, you guys are all here, it's been 23 hours, and it's my fault. Joe, yeah, um, can you top that? Yeah, <laughs> well, mine my, my is more sentimental. Um, last year we did uh, the Inland Empire 48 hour film project, and the way we did that is, it was basically my kids with me bossing around a little bit. So <laughs> my director was my 17 year old son, my cinematographer was my 14 year old son, and my daughter who was 13, was the writer. And, we drew a time travel movie, and they did just such a fantastic job. I edited it for them, but uh, most, mostly they did the whole film from the, the production of the film by themselves with me yelling at them here and there. But uh, uh, they ended up second runner-up, and they won some awards for the best use of the character and the best use of the line of dialogue. Was just... So I guess the most memorable part is at the awards ceremony. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Dwayne? Um, An experience you'd like to forget? I like to forget, um, the, the first uh, 48 style film I did was a 48 Hours of Madness, uh, which is a student competition. They give you a script and they, they let you know ahead of time like what characters you need and what a general idea of what location you'll need and then they give you a script and you're, you're able to read, read, write the script as long as you stay within the arc of the story. And I was producer, director, writer, camera editor, like all that stuff, and I, I remember cutting together this film, and it was, everyone had gone to sleep, I, I'd been up at that point well beyond 48 hours, and uh, I'm trying to edit this thing, and I was just crushed because I thought I'd totally screwed everyone because I could not find a film in, in all this edit. And my friend uh, Carrie, who um, I went to school with, she eventually went to AFI, and got her master's in producing, is working up in, in the industry now, but she woke up and she goes, you know what, let me take a look at it. And I'm like, fine, and I had this antique barbershop chair and I just leaned it back and crashed and uh, woke up about two hours later and she had found a film in all that footage. So it was, it was a bittersweet moment. It was like, damn, I wrote this story and I shot this story and I edited this story and I had no film and, and, and I'm so glad you found one. <laughs> Which film was that? Uh, that was uh, um, one you've Any other seen, actually. questions? <laughs> yes, Walter. So there was there's some clues offered here um, about the, the footage being transferred to uh, some digital media. Yes. So it sounds like that's the form of at least the, the physical media that's being returned in would yeah. be... A flash that. drive. So the other question is uh, Kodak. Because yeah. I know that Mike had mentioned okay. Kodak. What, what I what I what we have recommended in the past, uh, we've worked with Cineform, and Cineform, uh, who is a, a software uh, company that was purchased by GoPro, and they use the GoPro or they use the Cineform Kodak uh, because it's what they they wanted. Because we were prior to building DCP that we could actually load on the theater system at the theater, we were bringing in a server. Uh, or uh, you know a computer to hook up to the projector, so we needed uh, a, a a codec that everyone agreed on. So we asked everyone to submit in the Cineform codec. Um, you, I would still like you to do that because I convert to that codec from no matter what was turned in because it's easier to make DCP uh, file sets from that to load on the projector. The codec is very easy to get. No matter what editor you have, go to GoPro download their GoPro Studio software. You don't even have to use the Studio software, but when you install it on your computer, it loads the codec into your editor. And then it'll, it'll show up as your list, do 1080, 24P, and that's what you export as. And uh, in the Cineform codec, and whether it's a QuickTime uh, movie or a Windows AVI, and that's, that's what I'd like to get. 
that makes it so much easier to me for me because if we get the 130 teams and we screw the Frenchies this year, um, then I will have 130 films that I, hopefully I don't have to convert 130 to Cineform and then DCP. So. You also mentioned the Windows AVI is either AVI yeah. uncompressed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It, the codec. The codec is the compression. So uh, if you can save in the Cineform codec, then that would be the best way for us. And. Practice that. Do an export before the weekend starts so that you know how long it's going to take and what the results are going to be like. Um, there have been a number of times where, where uh, teams have, been, have, have missed the deadline because they started exporting too late because they didn't know. And the other thing, there was one year where there was a, a hitch in the software when, where when you exported it, and then went to play that file, it wouldn't play. But if you exported it and then quit the program and then played the file, it would play. But nobody knew that. And so there were teams that were exporting it and not being able to see the file. And then they'd export it again and still not be able to see the file. And so there were, there were teams that were delayed because of that. So, yeah, 1080 24P is the best. You know, one other thing about that also is that if, if you go on the, the uh, 48hourfilm.com slash San Diego page, they have listed um, the requirements for submission. Ignore that. Because the reason, what they do is, is back at the 48-hour headquarters, they have this already pre-written to go on all the web pages. And San Diego being the only high def 48-hour city, those uh, requirements that they have don't match what we really want to see in San Diego. So as a, the team leader, and you know, this is one other very important thing. If you're a team leader, make sure you share the emails that I send out to you with your crew. Uh, not only does that give them, let them know what's going on, but it, it, it backs you up. The, they have your six then because they've read the emails too. And if you're in editing and you're trying to export, and it's not working, you might have someone else that's read the email and it's like, oh wait, you have to go download this or, or this is the best way to do it. So um, it's, uh, communication is key. Let all your, you know, send all this out to your crew, have them go to, um, you know, sign up for the newsletters and stuff as well. Uh, and then everyone is in the loop. Let me ask you this. Um, three of you have a lot of experience. You have production companies, you have Atomic Fizz, your company and then preposterous films and all. So you do this year round. These three guys have lots and lots of experience in filmmaking. And this is a lot of work. Now what, besides the enormous amount of money you get back from it, <laughs> what brings you back year after year? Because you, and, and you producing it now the fifth year, we yeah. hope the sixth yeah. too. But what brings you back to doing it? Why, why are you driven? What insanity? For me the challenge is some new way of, you know, some new idea or something every year. I love, my favorite thing, favorite, favorite, favorite is uh, standing by the red carpet and seeing people walk down the red carpet and just absolutely excited to high heaven about going to see their film. And the, the collaboration, uh, the, the almost camaraderie that you have with these filmmakers that you develop over time is just phenomenal. And I, I just love that part of it. And that keeps me coming back. You know, we started this year, we started planning mid-January. And the, the kickoff isn't until July 12th. And we've, we started planning mid-January. We started talking about it at the end last year in, in July. And started actively planning and starting contacting people and stuff in mid-January. So it's a long haul for us. Mike? Um, the, I've, been, I've been doing video production for a long time. Uh, low budget commercials, web videos, basically anything that walks in the door. Uh, in 2008, um, I was with I was at a, an MCAI meeting, which is a Media Communications Association International, um, professional video people. I was a member of that group. I had met a number of people who were really cool, but we had never gotten the opportunity to work with each other because we were all one-man bands. And so there were four of us sitting around, and one of us said, you know, the 48-hour film project's coming up. And, and somebody said, 
you know what, I've wanted to do that. And somebody else said, well, I did it last year, but I didn't like that team I was with. And somebody else said, well, I'll edit it. And somebody else said, well, I'll shoot it. And I said, well, I'll direct it. And I'm totally waiting for them to go, nah. <laughs> um, and the fourth person said, well, what do you want me to do? And all three of us said, you'll produce. <laughs> um, and, and we went from there to, to in this sound stage, three weeks later, we, had, we built a set that was an, an anteroom in Ford's theater. And we had, we had wardrobe and this remarkable lighting. And we had everything come together. And there was a moment where, after, after dinner, the actors came down to the set. And we turned off the house lights. And we just were left with the movie lights. And the world changed. Um, we went from making a movie to looking into this window into the past. And, and I'm getting chills right now because of it. It's the air conditioning. Um, no, it's, it was, it changed my view of the world. I can't, I, I can't not do this because of those moments, because of the moments where you, you can capture something that you didn't think could possibly be captured. That you can be sitting in a theater and hear people laugh at something on purpose. Um, that you can, you can, the highest praise I've ever gotten was after that first screening where we're all, the opening shot of this is this dolly where Mary Todd is, is just, Devastated, and she gets walked into this. She's walked into this room, and it's this the emotional dolly thing. And and <clears throat> at the end of that evening, this this young man and I are talking, and he says, "What film did you do?" And I said, "It was the Abraham Lincoln one." And he says, and I quote, "Dude, when that dolly shot happened, I just went shit." <laughs> <laughs> It was the San Diego uh, project. <laughs> Parisians are better. <laughs> More like the OB uh, festival. <laughs> so you met my son. <laughs> Joe? <laughs> yeah. Um, you don't have to top yeah, that. No, but. no. Well, for me, it's like, the, it's like the proud papa moment when the film pops up on the screen. And not, and not just from, not from myself. I've already seen it 12, 12, 15 times. It's, you know, for the cast and crew who are seeing it for the first time. And as Dwayne says, I don't share with them other than the editor and the director were the only ones that see the film until it pops up on the screen. And, and that's like a, like I said, a proud pop moment. It's so exciting. It's such a thrill. And the, the fact that the San Diego 48-hour uh, film project is HD is remarkable. Um, when you see your film up there, it looks, it feels like you're watching a feature film. It feels like a damn movie, and to have that happen, I mean, there, was a, there have been a number of times where I've been sitting there watching my own film going, wow, this is great, holy crap, this is mine, <laughs> because it looks so remarkable, and it's just a, I mean, if, if, you, if, if you have that experience, I guarantee you'll be back. Well, I think it's to your credit, Wayne, taking this over and producing it since 2000, was it 2005? 2009, and um, yes, yeah. and trying to make it even like, more each year, you know. You know, I, I would like to mention San Diego Songwriters again. One thing that, that we didn't mention is not only do they have online music that you can download to use in your film, but a lot of their songwriters, Jeffrey Beach here somewhere, uh, one of them, there he is in the back, uh, he uh, you know, well, he's doing a, a team of his own this year, but a lot of these songwriters will actually collaborate with you on your film. So it's not just downloading their music. They'll sit there and they'll look at your stuff. And Jeff last year was composing stuff live, uh, right, watching the playback, you know, for, for it. And it's just phenomenal collaboration. Scoring on the fly. Yeah. You know, it was really good. 
right, Mike, you've been in this uh, for a long time, and, and Joe, so I'd like to give these guys a round of applause for just sharing their information and all that. All three. Feel free to network. Talk to our panelists here. We'll be here till 9 o'clock. So uh, thank you all for coming.